song I'm going to sing now is a new song, <coughs> so it's not on the album, and it's called Bring It Back. <coughs> This song is called I Found You. <clears throat> mm. 
far across the ocean so blue high up in the sky I see you light and love pour through down on me Down on me, oh God, I feel you. God, you're everything I see. God, you are everything to me. Oh God, I found you. Are 
set my heart free. Your love has set my heart free. Your love has set my heart free. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, once the album came, it's been, we was sharing little earbuds on planes and just listening, <laughs> forgetting we're on a plane, yeah. just uh, giving way to that experience, just of the connection and the love. Well, I think I was talking earlier to me about the importance of guidance because um, we learn from A Course in Miracles that, that guidance is always evaluative. I mean, anything that would involve instructions, directions in time and space will be evaluative. And so when I first saw that, I thought, oh, so that's how I go from a chaotic mind of judgment to an, a calm, still mind of judgment to a state of complete oneness that transcends judgment entirely. It's the Holy Spirit's use of judgment for a mind that believes in duality, that believes in separation. The Holy Spirit has to reach the mind in a way that's meaningful and that, to me, is what guidance is. That's what the intuition is. And there's a nice little section at the beginning of the Rules for Decision in A Course in Miracles, where Jesus says, your one remaining problem is that you decide first what to do and then ask. <laughs> and that's pretty succinct, you know, it's like, oh, that's why. So even if you call something judgment, and you call something guidance, but, but it doesn't involve that prayer of the heart of asking, then that's where the difficulties come in. Because if you decide first and then ask, means you decide first based on your past learning, means you already have crystallized expectations for what the situation is, how to react to it, and what to do based on that past learning. And then the guidance is actually blocked from coming through. So the reverse of that would be ask first, and then be told what to do. And even um, Helen Schuckman, who was the scribe of A Course in Miracles, you know, she had quite some resistance that would kick in, sometimes for hours or days, and that's when Jesus, after some period of days went by, I think even a week, uh, he basically uttered the words, a good scribe should be under Christ control. <laughs> so you see, if you can go so far on your leash <laughs> of believing that you have a separate will from God, and you know what's best, and you know how to get yourself out of an impossible situation, having not even remembered getting into it in the first place, now convinced you can get yourself out by yourself. You know, it's not going to work, but, but this Christ control thing is really another, just another way of describing guidance. That we actually need guidance, we need to tune in to the way that will take us out, unwind us from this self-concept and will take us back to the light. So to me, guidance is something that's very practical. I know, I think uh, they always talk about what's, what's the method. I, I believe that like Jesus gave me the course in 1986 and then gave me like five years to like immerse <coughs> into it and then um, the method was more like, okay, enough now with the, the principles, 
we're going on a road trip, and that's when he took me on five years of study and immersion, and then five years of road trip. You know, it's kind of like in science class, you've got the textbook, and then you go into the lab, and the road trip was the lab, because, because traveling around the United States and Canada, yeah, where do I stay, who am I supposed to meet, where am I going to go, where am I going to get the money to travel, and all the typical things you would think about. Uh, I didn't know at the time, he didn't tell me it was a five-year road trip, so that was good. <laughs> I, I don't think I would have got out of, the, out of the gate if I, if I said, well, for the next five years, you know, you're, I'm going to be uh, running the show here, and you're just going to be showing up and, and listening and following. But also, it seemed to take those five years to really surrender to it, because there was so much pride and so much, I, I know mine, that, uh, you know, was already directing the show, so it was like, it's a tough nut to crack, but getting out there on the road, that's one of the best mechanisms for loosening that control of things. And it did come after a surrender, like, okay, here's my life, you do what you want with it for the good of the whole, and then, so I can't say that I didn't ask for it, I prayed for it, I asked for it, and then it came step by step, moment by moment. And that's why in the Manual for Teachers it's called the stages of the development of trust. Because again, the mind is very powerful, so it's just, we'll say, trusting in a bunch of ego beliefs, most of which are unconscious. And that's why we're in a survival mode. That's why we have so much control, planning, trying to navigate time and space and figure out how we're going to live. What are we going to do? What about for old age? You know, all these what ifs, what ifs. Um, I do remember that my grandfather passed away in 1982, but he had these twinkly, sparkly eyes and uh, he was very simple, and uh, even when I would watch sporting events with him, uh, and I would get into the, what the next play would be, or what should have happened, what could have happened, the coulda, woulda, shouldas, he would always, you know, raise one finger with me and say, if, largest word in the English language. And he was teaching me about hypotheticals. Before the course came. He was like the coulda, woulda, shoulda's. You know, don't cry over spilt milk. Don't, don't get your mind into all these possibilities of what could be different. It's a version of, I'd be happy if things were different. Which Jesus tells us in the workbook of A Course in Miracles is the ego's plan of salvation. That you would be happy if anything except yourself was different. <laughs> And the plan of the Holy Spirit is, if you change your mind, you'll be happy, <coughs> if you change your purpose. So those are the two plans of salvation set side by side. If something else would change other than myself, I would be happy, and if I change my mind about myself, I would be happy. That's nice to see them side by side, because the human condition seems to be just an acceptance of the ego's plan for salvation. The mind is just going in circles, like Groundhog Day, looping, 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 trying out more outcomes, more possibilities, more scenarios, and then being told, the more the better. So we <laughs> can get pretty wild in there, and then finally there's like a humble sense of, no, I need to change my mind about my mind. I need to come back to my eternal self. I need to realize that this game of playing human on the timeline is exhausting, it can be frustrating, boring, times depressing, and so it's like coming to that. And so I think on the authentic spiritual journey, what I discovered in my life, and I think this is true for most people, is that there is a, a disillusionment that comes. There is, like in 12 steps, they call it bottoming out, like hitting bottom, where you have a, a, a feeling of being out of control, or disillusioned, or depressed, or frustrated, and then 
it gets so intense and so extreme that you finally have this kind of like, the course, there has to be a better way. The, the prayer that Bill and Helen came to before they started the course. I was describing to Judy during lunch, you know, my disillusionment and my frustrations way back before the course came into my life. And um, a lot of it had to do with my grandfather being diagnosed with cancer and me going to visit him in the hospital, Good Samaritan Hospital, and and facing a lot of perceptions that were very hard for me to take. I was in, in school and in university in my 20s and then watching him go down to like a walking skeleton and and him grabbing my, my hand when I would visit him in the hospital and kind of whispering things in my ear that I, I loved him and I had so much love and devotion for him and yet he would like hold on to me very skinny and whisper in my ear, get me out of here. <laughs> and there's nothing like being in your early 20s and loving someone and feeling their call for help and yet that get me out of here, I just was like, oh, it, it really forced me to face a lot of things and it actually forced me into look deeper at what I believe God was and and really go deep into this idea, did God have anything to do with this world, or anything to do with suffering, or anything to do with what I was perceiving with my grandfather. That kind of shook me to the core. And when I was talking to Judy yesterday about this, she said, oh that's interesting, that disillusionment, because she said her first husband, Bob, Bob Sketch, had gone through a similar thing, where um, yeah, going to synagogues and and growing up where there was all this focus in the Jewish religion and God and so on and so forth and, and there was this feeling like, what is this, like almost like hypocrisy, all this focus on God, God, God and and suffering. Uh, it's been that, those existential questions of how do you deal with suffering? And if we connect it with God, then we end up with an anger at God, or we end up with atheism, or we end up with huge resistance and rebellion. And then she was saying yesterday, she said, yeah, at one point, when Judy was just really getting into the Course, and reading the book, and highlighting that, that her husband would occasionally come across and take a look at it, and then read that part about, you know, he looked at it, and it said, God did not create this world. And he's like, what? <laughs> it was almost like, there's the thread. <laughs> there's a lot of anger at God, but that one line that he happened to have his eyes fall on in that book that his wife was reading about God did not create this world, then that really was the thread that started to open his mind up to, to a healing. And I think it was the same with me. I had a, a great disillusionment, and then when I really faced it, then I started receiving this intuitive uh, wisdom that is like, no, you're looking through a very darkened glass, you are not seeing clearly, you are misperceiving, and that in truth God does not have anything to do with suffering. Uh, in fact, there's a part in The Course in Miracles where it's so blunt, and it's so straightforward, and it's so frank that it just, it almost just takes the wind out of the ego's sail. It says, um, if God is real, there is no pain. And if pain is real, there is no God. It's like, okay. Another part in the, in the um, Beyond All Idol sections, there's a sentence that said, God knows not form. So this is where those metaphysics are starting to realize that God is light, Christ is light, God is abstract, not specific, Christ is abstract, not specific, although Jesus was a specific that was a demonstration of the abstraction behind the dream, behind the form. So it's not Christ is a man or a woman, or male or female, or masculine or feminine, it's really Christ is the state of perfect oneness, a, a perfect idea in the mind of God, 
And then as you start to apply those metaphysics to your daily life, it just gets more humble and more humble as you go along. So humble that salvation is not described in the Course as Jesus coming down on a white horse with a sword in his hand, you know, to to take the the good ones up and the wicked ones would, would perish and burn. It actually is taking us to a place where salvation is. I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, or how to look upon myself or the world. To the ego, salvation sounds like the most gullible state that there could be. The ego would say, oh yeah, salvation. You just keep unlearning until you're an imbecile. <laughs> and then, when you're an imbecile, you pass over the threshold into being an idiot. <laughs> and then your God saves you, uh, you know, in your state of being a total idiot. And that's how it would interpret this humbling journey of loosening from the personality self, loosening from the mask. You know, the, the personality, persona, that's the Latin word for mask, of really loosening and letting go of the mask, dropping the mask, and having that sense of adventure and discovery of show me. Almost like a little child who who doesn't know the way and sticks out their arm and their hand to their parent to say, take, I want to take your hand, I want to trust you, you know, I would but follow. So to me, that was the most ex important experience, was going through the disillusionment, having some insights and epiphanies, and then going like, wow, okay, the adventure begins. I will listen, I will follow, and I don't know the form of the adventure, but I do know that I actually like not having to plan the adventure. Uh, it was very heavy to try to plan and figure out everything about the future. I even had a degree, I mentioned a five-year co-op degree from a University of Cincinnati in urban planning, and then, yeah, almost like a joke, uh, getting through with that and then starting to feel like, I don't really feel like I'm really going to be using this degree. <laughs> then I got shifted over into psychology and a lot of things that were more focused on the mind, which was a good preparation for A Course in Miracles, which is completely focused on the mind, like saying health is inner peace, sickness is, uh, is, is in the mind, sickness is a decision, a wrong-minded decision, and you can learn to be right-minded all the time and accept the atonement, which takes you beyond the dualities of time and space. Okay, that's, wow, that's a, that's a real adventure. And then, step by step, things, the biggest thing for me was this sense of scarcity and lack, like, well, this is not something that I find very much in the history books, Jesus. Uh, you know, there's not like a lot of role models uh, for this, and he's like, well, yeah, it may be so, but um, if you open your mind and you open yourself to see what I'm going to show you, I'll give you the witnesses. I'll convince you that it's okay, that you're not going to starve, that you're not going to, you know, find yourself... Uh, Homeless, you already are homeless. <laughs> you, know, you, you just don't know it. You're kind of in a deep state of uh, delusion uh, there where you're homeless but you think you're home. And that your home is in your body and your home is in the world and you know the country and all these things. And so that's what the adventure has been. It's been letting go, letting go, letting go. Uh, even the movies I've shown that the ones, the characters that I seem to love the most are the ones that are the most clueless. And if they're clueless and trusting, then they're really good role models. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of them. Um, there's a lot of other role models for being competent and achieving and, and on top of the, the world and successful and so forth. But when Jesus 
says in the Course, the world is backwards and upside down. I took him, I took it on face value. When Jesus says you can't judge your advances from your retreats, I took it at face value. I took it as, oh, you're, ex you're just giving me pep talks to trust and to let go of what I al already thought I knew so that I can be open-minded to be shown what I need to know. Jesus said, yep, it starts off with ten characteristics of teacher of God. The first one's trust, and the last one's open-mindedness. And you will progress through them all, and you will find yourself into a, a state of trusting cluelessness that actually is the sign of an open mind, that doesn't think it has everything figured out, that, that can then experience agape love, true, full appreciation, full gratitude, and, and be in a state where you just are living gratitude. Everything is part of this living gratitude. Where your heart, beyond the words, is just kind of in a state of perpetual thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything. Uh, we have a, an, a retreat coming up in August, and uh, uh, one of the the musicians we have coming is from the Bay Area here, Amanabad, and this, you might have heard of this song, Thank You. He has a, an amazing song called Thank You, and it's like your thank you song. It's just, you know, you feel the, the gratitude just welling up in your heart when you listen to it. Because it's so natural to be grateful, to be, to have that gratitude. and. And it's unnatural to be competitive, and it's unnatural to be driven for outcomes in the future. And all the things that our programming has said are, are good and valuable in terms of this world, need to be given over to the Spirit. It's not like we have to, there's some kind of sentinels that get sent in to search and destroy mission to devour them in our mind, it's more that the, the Holy Spirit has to honor what the ego made, because it was made by this powerful mind that's a sleeping Christ. So the Holy Spirit doesn't destroy anything, ever. The Holy Spirit just has to reinterpret what the ego made. Mm -hmm. Somehow that is comforting to me, that the, the solution in the mind is a tweak. It's just a tweak of purpose. Okay, so these skills and abilities and world and cosmos was made in hatred, and tweak, <laughs> tweak, turned over to the spirit, then there's a new interpretation coming. There's not a destruction, it never says in the, in the Course that uh, the Holy Spirit must destroy your fragmented perception. In fact, it even talks about specialness and says, <coughs> give your special relationships over to the Holy Spirit so that they can be reinterpreted and be turned into holy relationships. It doesn't say destroy the specialness, it says give it over and let it be reinterpreted. So I see that as a tweak in the mind. And something good is nice about tweak, because it can seem like the human condition is so dark and chaotic and it's been going on for so long, for a millennium. Jesus said in that lesson 75, you know, your, he called it your, your uh, dream of what was it? Um, hmm? Not exile, <laughs> but I've already thought, forgot it. Dream of um, destruction. Dis destruction. 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 Isolation, desolation, desolation. Disaster. 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 Oh, I remembered it. Your dream, your dream of disaster. Yeah. So, so for me, disaster is a pretty strong word, <laughs> but tweak is also a word that I like. Okay, disaster, tweak. <laughs> yes, like. You know, I have to turn this around to see the blessing. See the blessing. If I can see the blessing, see it in a new way, then I can have the gratitude. I'll back into the 
the gratitude, the flow of gratitude. So I feel like it takes a willingness to go and be so humble in that way. And uh, now it's just come to the point where it's like, it's like things seem to be occurring, but there's, there's a feeling of flow with everything. And it's in one sense like not trying to be uh, driving your own destiny uh, in terms of form. We do have a, a destiny to wake up. We have a destiny of Christhood, so to speak, we, uh, of pure beingness. And, and that destiny is like a calling. It won't go away. It will never go away. It won't disappear until we experience the actuality of what that state of mind is. Then the call disappears. But until there's that full embracing of the of the real self, of the true self, then there's going to be this call that just keeps coming to us and keeps wanting to us to to accept it, to come to a state of uh, fulfillment, of contentment in that. And the nuances of that still seem to be about developing trust. Sundari's been waiting to bring up the trust. I, I, I really have. Yes. Do we have a microphone? So, Sean has a microphone. We've 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 upgraded from our morning or earlier session. Or later. Now we've got a microphone <laughs> with a long cord. No, no, sit. No, you sit back and relax. Trust that that microphone will come across the room. <laughs> So, I've had this sort of burning thing going on with trust. Um, just, just it has me on fire, and my guidance is really good, and my life is full of miracles, and I have this residual patterning. It's like, in you know, I know where it's from from childhood, where, like in a year, year and a half period, five or six or seven people and institutions and deaths and personal things all turned against me in a second where they all looked like good relationships and I trusted them and they just you know and somehow I'm repeating that pattern over and over and over with a kind of subtle um, you know I can feel the 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 I can feel the trust of spirit and the Miracles, but then at the other side, I'm feeling how it's happened so often that I that there's a, a just sense that in this thing that I look at is a great relationship with you know say a group, say a person, and it happens both with institutions and with people, and even if they're friends for 30 years, and all of a sudden there'd be a flip, and they don't want to know me or don't want to see me or don't you. Know, and I can see that it's like a mistrust of my existence and creation. Uh, or or it, it's something, it's like I can't think of anything deeper in me. I mean, it, and I keep, um, there's this little active, activated template that goes on over and over and over that I'm just so, it's so abrasive to me and so, and I, you know, could be just like infinite practices of forgiveness, but I'm so sick of this pattern. I not sick, that's a bad word because any word we use has a flow of energetic around it. So um, I would love to surrender this pattern to spirit and have no idea. Um, you know, I can think of just choosing to be happy, which I have the capability of doing. And yet there's this buildup of, um, it almost seems to be more active and more circumstances and over and over and over. And when I'm just alone with myself, it's very painful, very painful that, uh, because it makes me not want to really trust, step, I get tired of stepping out into relationships and having them reverse on your institution. So I'm wondering of uh, some um, insight from 
spirit through you as to how to deactivate these patterns that can be so clearly seen and yet just is sticking to me. Yeah, beautiful. Well, the first thing that's coming to me that that because I can relate to that position and I can relate to that feeling even uh, of, of facing that and and feeling very um, yeah just kind of like when will this end kind of feeling like this must stop this must come to an end one of the things that helped me was um, was being reminded again from Jesus about uh, interpretations. He was saying, you, you, you never get upset, you never feel abandoned, you never feel rejection because of what has happened, but because of your interpretation mm. of what has happened. Well, that was helpful because it, it put me to focus more on that filter of interpretation and it helped to be reminded that, that, oh, I always had the power of interpretation. Regardless of whatever events were occurring, that the events and the circumstances and the people and their reactions and their faces and, and everything that I was perceiving was not the cause. It was the interpretation in the mind that was the problem. Which Actually, that was a big advance because then it's, it was basically saying, we, that's why we, it is with your thoughts alone that we must work. That really those emotions are tied into those thoughts and as long as you still have those thoughts, you still have those interpretations and you still feel those feelings. The other thing helped me, there was one line in the Course too that helped me where because for me it was the accuser. I, I just thought, I just am going along and I'm getting happier and happier and then I get blindsided. Uh, almost like torpedoed in a way without seeing the torpedo coming. Like you think you're just cruising along there and now you've got it and you, you're loving it and okay here we go, beam me up, you know, um, and, and then the torpedo comes and you don't see it and it just hits you from mm -hmm. blindsides you and, and it was this feeling of vulnerability, feeling of a, a bit being volatile because it's like how can I have consistency if these torpedoes still hit me and they, they're unseen, like I, how can you even prepare for it if you, have no, you don't even see it coming. And there was one line that just helped me a lot, which was, um, he said, the role of the accuser will appear in many forms, and it will seem to be accusing you. Have no fear, it will go at last. Well, I was like, I love that line. I was just like, you got my attention. Yeah, I was following, 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 and have no, it ends with have no fear, we'll go at last. And I was going through that because I was like, okay, we'll go at last. Thank you. That's, that's very hopeful if that's what's being given. It was like he was saying, there is a state of mind where it, it reminded me almost of the Herman Hesse's Siddhartha movie, you know, where, where uh, Siddhartha is under the Bodhi tree and, and all these things come, you know, <coughs> legions of marching and flaming arrows and, and then there came a point where the arrows would even come, you see them being fired and come flaming in and then they would turn into like these, these petals, like these flower petals. And it was such a graphic depiction of these flaming arrows turning into these flower petals. Because the flower petals were so beautiful. The arrows, flaming arrows, you know, it looked pretty, pretty bad with these, all these arrows being launched. And so I was like, okay, so it's, it's a change of perception, so I have to learn to interpret things differently. So what are my options here? Well, there are these egoic interpretations which involve attack, which involve the perception of victims and victimizers, which 
evolve the perception of attackers and attacky and and it was pretty similar to what you're expressing. It was like, yeah, I seem to be on the the bad end of the attack. Uh, I seem to be psychically uh, broadsided and attacked by things that I don't understand and I don't see where they're coming. It you know reminded me of the movies I watched years ago. Remember um, uh, Braveheart? Uh, oh, I was all into that movie and you know Mel Gibson and yeah, hang in there and hang in there and then the one that he trusted the most, you know, flips and turns into the betrayer, and uh, that was shocking. And, and it was like, that was one of those kind of broadside, like hitting broadside. I remember too, there was a, a movie with uh, Michelle Pfeiffer in, and the title of the movie was, What Lies Beneath? And so I'm watching the movie, and Michelle Pfeiffer, and she's got this sweet husband, and oh, the casting was great in that, this sweet husband played by Harrison Ford. Oh, I was all like watching them and they're lovey dovey, lovey dovey. And then at some point in the movie, it's like he turns and he's what lies beneath. It's her husband trying to kill her. And I'm just like watching as Harrison Ford. Wait a minute, Harrison Ford? How can you cast Harrison Ford? In that kind of, you know, that was not even, and I was, and then the title of What Lies Beneath, it was like, oh my gosh, this must be the unconscious mind, because you don't see it coming. You know, you're going along, and it's pretty convincing that they're in love, and then, whoa, this comes in out of nowhere. If you have this issue, you could watch that movie. <laughs> uh, that will give you a big forgiveness opportunity, because it's, it's unseen, that's what, and even with horror movies, that's the, the most horrific things are the things that you have no anticipation of. And you're going along the movie, and then this music starts, and then you're like, starting to go, watch it there, watch it, and then all of a sudden, it's just in the way that you least expect it. And that's how this healing occurs. There's, there's darkness that's buried, it's pushed out of awareness, it comes out in the role of the accuser. And it will seem to be accusing you. Well, spirit doesn't ever have a threat because there's only one spirit. So it's not like, it's not like God's there and Christ is there in heaven and God goes boo. <laughs> you know, God never goes boo to Christ. It's all this love and it's like an eternal song of love and gratitude from the the Creator to the creation just goes on and on and on, bellowing on and on and on in eternity. Just love and gratitude. There's no boo. There's. It's not like the Holy Spirit is a character. Gotcha, or you know, aha. You know, the the Spirit's not like that. The, the Spirit doesn't destroy. There's no devious part of the Spirit. Spirit is unified. But to the ego and this personality self, this mask that it made up. That's why Jesus says, the role of the accuser will appear in many forms and it will seem, he says, seem to be accusing you. It's a seem because it's coming through the interpretation and the filter of the personality self. It's looking for love from those figures. They could be professors, they could be parents, siblings, could be neighbors, friends, and so on and so forth. Where it's like, well, no friends are supposed to be friendly. Friends are friendly. Friends don't stab you in the back. Uh, uh, parents are supposed to be nurturing and loving, and they don't uh, leave you in the the dust or leave you out in the cold. You know, that's not what a parent's supposed to be. You see, the ego has made up this world of cosmos of time and space and it passed out all of the roles that all the characters are going to play. All the worlds, the stage and everyone was played their part. Guess who passed out all the part? In the ancient instant, which Jesus calls the unholy instant, the time of terror is another 
phrase he uses. Mm -hmm. That's when the parts got passed out. And when the ego judges that a particular part is threatening, or unloving, or whatever, then that's where that feeling of attack comes in, or uh, of being accused. That's, that's a pretty common word, ac accused. And so, um, you get into spirituality, even you get into the Course, and, uh, and that role of accuser can actually come out in your Course group. It can actually come out in places where you don't expect, where you say, Oh no, not my course group. This is my Course in Miracles group. That role of the accuser can come out right there. There was one time, I, this is a true story, after many years of Gary Renard traveling around to the world and doing these teachings and everything, he finally went up to Roscoe to visit Ken Wabnick. And and he went up to Ken and he said, Course students are vicious. They are absolutely vicious. He said, I had a calmer life when I was just up there in Maine and Art and Persa come and visit me, come to my couch. It's all calm. It's a little disturbing. But they were basically very civil. These ascended masters are really civil. But Course students are absolutely vicious. And Ken said, Yeah. Stay away from them. <laughs> uh, and the, the whole point is, it's that sense of where you would least expect. That's where the accuser comes in stronger, because of, of the expectation. You, know, you don't think that it should come from certain ones. Okay, it's almost like the parts were passed out of this day. Mussolini, accuser. Hitler, Accuser. Osama bin Laden. Accuser. Trump. <laughs> Course in Miracles facilitator. Ah! <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, there's certain assigned roles where it's like, no, 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 that's not good. Not good at all. And that's where it gets you where you least expect it. But don't you like those comforting words? Again, that's what a comforter is supposed to do, is comfort you, is inspire hope. Have no fear, it shall go at last. Not, it's not described even as a battle, it just says, it shall go at last. It's almost like it's going to fall away, it's going to drop off. It's inevitable, it will drop off. And so, to me, that's, that's part of the transfer of training because Jesus does, he does tell us a bit about the dynamics of how this works. You know, his first lesson is nothing I see means anything. I've given everything I see, all the meaning has for me. He goes, he gives you a mind training program, and then he works his way all the way up to lesson 23, which is basically he spills the beans in lessons 23. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. Now he's given the whole thing away. He's already in the first 23 lessons, he's given his whole journey to freedom away by, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. And then he does go on a little bit further and says that you will not be willing to let these attack thoughts go until you realize that attacking and being attacked are the same. You see, he, now he's not only giving you the whole escape hatch, but he's actually saying, and now I'm going to tell you how you're going to do this. You will do this when you realize that there's no difference between attacking and being attacked. And then you really start to see the ego's trick. Because the ego makes up a world of duality, which is really just a bunch of images, but it divides all those images into attackers, and attackees. You see, it's, it's saying, oh no, they're not all the same at all. You know, even though he says, I have no neutral thoughts, I see no neutral things, you know, I'm not alone in experiencing the effects of my seeing, the effects of my thoughts. He's really teaching us that the thoughts you think, you think, and the images you think you see are the same. 
Why is that important? Is because attack thoughts are never helpful to your peaceful state of mind, ever. And it doesn't even matter whether you look through the filter and you see some as attackers and some as attackees. We've been mesmerized into believing that there are these two types of people. And you could call them the saints and the sinners, you could call them uh, the attackers, the attackees, the, the, the ones that don't seem to attack too much and don't seem to uh, be attacked too much. But you see there's these gradations and differences that is part of seeing the split in the world. And the split isn't in the world, the split's in the mind. It's trying to hold on to love and fear, two irreconcilable thought systems in the mind. And the trick then is the split is projected from the mind to the world. So instead of, oh, uh, right mind and wrong mind, it's Republican and Democrat. <laughs> it's Trump supporter and Trump hater. It's mega hat wearer and not no hat wearer. You, know, if you see how tricky the projection is, is the projection puts it out into something in form, and that's the, the hook. As soon as you buy the bait of that, then you can watch your mind start to go into justifying. Oh, it's not only right about the split being between Republicans and Democrats, Oh, but there's a lot of evidence uh, to support the difference, to prove the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. And believe me, oh, there's plenty of evidence. It just, it's a bottomless pit of evidence. It will just go on and on. What's the key? Justifying. It will go on justifying the hurt. Justifying the feeling of, of injustice with whatever story it wants to use from the past to do that. So, I think the key thing is, is start to realize that all opinions, all, all different perception of different sides and, and justifications, they're all part of a system de designed to keep the mind from healing. It's just an elaborate, ingenious, clever system that that the mind is, has fallen into when it's sleeping, and it, it doesn't bring about um, healing, it doesn't bring about release. I remember when I was reading the Course, I got later and later and later and later, and then I got to that part uh, called the Justice of Heaven, and I had been an activist. I, I bought that split hook, line and sinker, I was an activist, a social activist. When I was meeting with people, I was very accustomed to words like social justice. Mm -hmm. uh, I believed in social justice, and I worked hard towards social justice, and then I got to that section in the Course, The Justice of Heaven, and Jesus comes right out and says, there is no justice in this world. What? <laughs> I just spent how many decades of social activism and you're telling me in one sentence that there is no justice in this world. He said, if you want justice, that's heaven. Why is justice in heaven and not in this world? Well, it's because God created heaven and, and fairness. If you use the word fairness as, an op as a, like a synonym for justice, yeah, you're going to find fairness in spirit. You'll find fairness in heaven. You'll find fairness in love, divine agape love. You'll find fairness in oneness, but you won't find fairness in duality. Well, why not? Because God didn't create duality. God is a God of oneness. Oneness creates oneness. Even in this world you get pears from pear trees, you get apples from apple trees, you get cherries from cherry trees, you get spirit from spirit. Love creates like itself. That's a workbook lesson. Love created me like itself. Even in the Bible it's, it says in Genesis that, that God created man in his likeness and image. And basically Jesus reinterprets that saying, God is spirit. He didn't create man in, in 
form, because God is in form, but in his likeness, of a like quality. A like quality to God is spirit. So, God created man in his likeness and image. God created man as spirit. Man is a spiritual origin. Not only origin, but essence, being, reality. It's the factual basis of everything, that, that spirit is real. And then this projected world is coming from that belief in separation. But again, the trick is, is you have to come to a place of, of actually seeing, actually being convinced by Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, of the impossibility of the trick. Because as long as the mind believes in projection, it's going to project the split. It thinks it can get away with it, you know, it's like, I can get away with this, look. And I can get mad at this one, and I can get justified in being mad at that one, and I can blame this one. Why? Because I've done it. And the Course is teaching, well, you may have convinced yourself that you've done it, and you may have convinced yourself you're a good projector of guilt and blame, but you're not. You're deluded. You're mistaken to think that you can do that, because God didn't create you with that ability to project error, project blame. So, when the Course talks about miscreation, he uses that word miscreation, that's no different than trying to project an error that already has been corrected. Why would you project an error that already has been corrected? Wouldn't it be better to accept the correction than to project the error? You see, because one, it's like firing a ray gun uh, into a mirror. <laughs> uh, that's not very smart, to, to be firing away with a ray gun into a mirror. So Dara, you use the mirror as the practice to see the Christ, you know, to affirm the Christ, to look in the mirror and overlook the form and come to the reality. That's the same thing of, of coming to this healing. So, in the end, it, you do, it doesn't matter what you did in the past, you come to a place where you realize you were mistaken and you say, I want another way. And I've been telling people recently that, I watched that first video that they made of A Course in Miracles when Judy looks so young and Jerry Jampolsky looks so young, it was, it was back I think in the 70s, the story of A Course in Miracles. So I'm watching, back in the 70s, the story of A Course in Miracles. Young Jerry Jampolsky, very young Judy, and, and also a very young William Whitson, uh, who had worked, he'd worked in the military, he'd worked in government for years, he was uh, an ambassador to China for the United Nations, government, 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 and then Wit, a young Wit, on the video is saying, as a government, like a, a full-time government employee, he said, he opened up the course and he read, Seek not to change the world, Seek rather to change your mind about the world. And I was telling Judy yesterday, it's not so much that line, which is powerful enough by itself, but who was speaking it? Not somebody who wants to get elected, but somebody who's been in the government for years, for decades. He talked about a servant, a, a civil servant, a government servant. He was a dedicated serving his country in the military, serving in the the Pentagon serving in, in the United Nations, serving in... I mean, when I talked to Witt, he would tell me, oh yeah, he would tell me about all the different characters in government and the different Congress people he knew, President, Vice President, this and this. He was a career government person, and he read that line, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. And he started following guidance. And he was guided to marry Judy. And he did. He was guided to help oversee these 20 some, 26, 27 publications into different languages. He gave his life 
to be used to change his mind. And then, when it came time to lay that body aside, he did it with the most grace and the most dignity that you could ever do. Now that's a salute. Now that's a job well done. You know, we, the people salute commanders and salute people who are given positions of power. But to me, Jesus is giving a salute for, thank you for changing your purpose. Thank you for changing your mind. Thank you for using all of your skills and abilities and integrity and everything that you use in government for your country and turning it over for this tweak in mind where I teach you how to go from hatred to love. That impressed me. I mean, I was very impressed by that, that, that early video. I was just like, wow! One guy uh, was a speechwriter for the President of the United States. I thought, to myself, I thought, wow, I'm studying this Course in Miracles book, but there's a speechwriter for the President of the United States who's studying A Course in Miracles. That, that hit me, I thought. Wow, you can study this book and be in that level of government? Mm -hmm. And then when Witt spoke, that touched me. And then there was one woman who worked with marine life and marine biology. I remember she had curly hair. I remember seeing her and she was like working with, with dolphins and with the environment. And she was studying the Course. And then they showed all these different characters even the minister, a Christian minister, who was talking about the Course from the pulpit. He was a minister out here in California. That got me, hearing a minister up at the pulpit with all the, the robes and everything on, talking about the Course. It was a very impactful video, not just for the teachings, but for the people that were attempting to change their mind in all these walks of life. That, as scientists, they showed a scientist talking about it. For some reason, that, that just struck me because I thought, they're, tr they're all trying to live this. They're all trying to the best of their ability to give their skills and ability, their position, everything over. And I remember the young Judy Scutch talking about, she said, wanting to see the world with real eyes. Using the play on words, real eyes, realize, she was using that, and I was like, wow. You know, she was very young and, and, and progressive, and I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. I've never heard of that before, and that was the first time I'd heard that kind of use of the words. And, you know, it just, it struck me. It helped me start to realize that I could do this. I could do it too. I would give my life over to it, like they were too. I think it also helped me to know that I wasn't alone in, in applying this, you know, when I was seeing these people in these different walks of life all applying it. And nowadays when we have lunch with Judy, we've had quite a few lunches with her, it's so rich to hear about all the people she knows in art, in famous musicians, and um, scientists, politicians, Marianne calling her up. Like, I am feeling guided to run for president, and it won't go away. It won't go away, you know, con confiding, you know. It's like, in all the walks of life, everyone has to learn to just take it and do what's given by the guidance, regardless of what that is. and and. I found as I've gone deeper in, there's so much letting go. Uh, there's so much letting go of, of ambitions, of that whole thing of wanting to make the world a better place, you know, like Michael Jackson's song, Heal the World, Make it a Better Place for You and Me and the entire human race. There's so much of that, make the world a better place that's in our unconscious mind. We have to let that be used in a way where we start to realize we've been mistaken. We can't just twinkle our nose like bewitched and go, okay, I'll never try to make the world a better place. <laughs> we actually have to be guided into an experience where we actually see that the split is in the mind. Actually experience the split for where it is, not 
try to react to it being external, outside of us. But that's, that's a huge devotion to give yourself over and say, I'm just going to follow your guidance, I'm going to trust that you know the way, out of this labyrinth, out of this maze, you know the way. For me, it, it has involved lots and lots of travel. I mean, I tell you, it, it started in the late 1980s, and going up to see Tara Singh, uh, a, a, a Sikh teacher of A Course in Miracles up in Monroe, Michigan, going up to see Ken and Gloria starting in 1990, then 1991, a number of visits to Roscoe, and then wham, wham bam, it started like with these huge travels, which I just see as a device for undoing beliefs in the mind, undoing preferences. When you're traveling, your sleeping preferences are flushed up. Your dietary preferences are in your face. Your climate preferences are right in your face. Your, your comfort preferences are right in your face. And Jesus is like, yeah, now you get the hang of it. I've got you for five years. He didn't tell me five years. He just told me, right now. If I, he said five years, I, I, ah, I'm out of here. But he took me one little step at a time for actually learning to trust the guidance to unwind these self-concept preferences, mm -hmm. self-concepts, you know, about all these things I'm talking about. And, and then it, it had to be so thorough that I don't think I could have really continued on as a teacher of, of God. You know, it's not hard in this world to be a teacher of the ego. That's like baseline. It's easy to be a teacher of the ego because the ego made the world, it made all the people, and it's just like, okay, we're just going to reinforce separation with everything you think, say, and do. But to, to allow yourself to go in another direction, to be used by God, you know, there's not many throughout history, you know, you can find the little, the St. Francis's, the Mother Teresa's, the Gandhi's, the Lao Tzu's, Jesus, Buddha, you know, you know, it's not like out of the trillions and trillions of human lives that, that the ones that seek for God are, they are definitely not a majority, they are a tiny, 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 tiny minority. And yet, when you work with this Course, you are clear that you are being called to be a miracle worker, to be a teacher of God. You don't even have to call it that, just to be peaceful. You're, you're being called into joy and harmony. And then you give yourself over to that, and you say, okay, here we go. I, I have no idea how this is going to work out. I have no idea even if I'm capable. But you apparently think I am because you are calling me. And I can't even use that old stuff from the Bible about the chosen ones, because Jesus reinterprets that. He said, no, all are called, few choose to listen. Are you going to be one that listens to me or not? Okay, I mean, forget the chosen ones, it's like, it, it brings it down to, in my heart, am I going to say yes to the call or, or not? And then when we do say yes, we don't even know what we're getting into. I never had a clue what I was getting into. I mean, I, I, I studied the Bible and I read Christianity and, and, you know, Bible studies and Bible school and all this and this, but there's that part in the red letter of the Bible where it says, um, for, the, for those who much is given, much will be asked or much will be required, depending on your... That was in the red letters. I didn't know what that meant. Then, now, 33 years later, I can go, ha, ha, right, much will be required, ha, ha, ha. Oh, very cute, that's cute, that's really cute, much, okay. Why don't you just say everything, why don't you just say everything, instead of much, you know, but, it, because no one would do it. <laughs> That's why no one would sign a, oh yeah, okay, right. You know, there's all, there's, we watched that funny movie, um, Bedazzled, where, uh, uh, what's her name, the actress, the model, she, 
she plays the devil, and then uh, Brandon Fraser is is he has to sign a contract and and give over his soul to the devil to get these seven wishes, and uh, yeah, it doesn't work out. Uh, Elizabeth Hurley uh, plays the uh, plays the devil, the attractive devil, and and after he he gets through like um, five, she says six wishes. He says, "Wait a minute, only five. She said, "No, I I got you a, a Big Mac and uh, and a Coke at the beginning." And he's like, "What? That was not a wish, you know?" And she said, "You asked for it. I gave it to you. That is, that counts as a wish. You use up six wishes." So, you know, there's even debate on what a, what a wish is, but that that one was always like, be careful, don't sell your soul to the devil. This is the flip side, it's like, all are called, few choose to listen, am I going to give my soul, my, my mind, my everything that I seem to have invented over to the Holy Spirit and Jesus to use for the awakening of everyone, or am I going to play holdout? and say, check over there, there's somebody over there. <laughs> that looks like a good candidate over there. Over there. No, you've got my, you took my mom already. You know, it's a, you know there's, the, the ego is going to want to play, play hold out. So, it's a convincing job, so part of what I'm sharing is, that's why I share a lot of parables, a lot of miracles, a lot of examples, use music, film, online retreats, I mean it just goes on and on, mind training centers, doing six week retreats with people, all kinds of things. It all is part of, of a sense of starting to realize it's, it's good, it's safe, it's, it's, it's inevitable, so why not give in to the inevitable of who you really are and save time for everyone else, because when you Jesus says, when I awoke, you were with me. It's how many teachers of God does it take to save the world? One. Uh, those are all meant to be encouraging signs that it's a perceptual problem. And when you allow yourself to be healed, it's like your Rubik's Cube of your mind is suddenly complete. And it's complete for everyone. It's, it's, it, it radiates out. It, he said, when you accept the gift of healing, he says in the workbook, legions upon legions will arise with you. So he's, that's his quantum way back <laughs> using the Course to say, it's all connected and when you accept the correction, it radiates, you free all the captives. Because there's only one of us and there's either one of us sleeping and dreaming of exile and or there's one of us awake in heaven with God and he's saying, let me tell you, it's the awakened heaven with God that's the truth. And the dreaming of exile and playing small and little is the lie. This is serpent's lie, you know. Don't listen to that lie. It's time. It's time already. Mm. It's the fastest session I've ever seen. We have a couple more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's do let's do a wrap up question, and then Sundari has, is going to sing a prayer for us to send us off, and and also we have another gathering coming up at Open Circle in Berkeley at seven o'clock, a panel discussion. Uh, so so if you are over this part of the area and you want to roll on into the next, you can pass my question. Oh, it's your no, birthday. No, no. Ask your question. It's your birthday. It's your birthday. It's Porsche's birthday. Ask your question. So here's my question. Do you want a microphone? No. Mm -hmm. She can talk. I can talk. <laughs> so it may not even be something that you've considered as much as I have with such frustration, but what you just ended with is the crux of why I get so furious. And, I mean, I've had miraculous things show me I am not wrong. This is like everything to me. So why are only few choosing to listen? It, it seems like, how could that be true? It's so stacked against by that statement. It just, it makes me really like, this can't be right then. It's like the, the very 
existential or fundamental fact of unity. All of us, the same one. Why wouldn't it be made such that, hey, everybody's doing it. Come on, we're all doing it. What do you think? I don't think there is an answer that will be the definitive answer, but it really gets at my gut. Like, I just can't, I just want everyone to come with me if I'm going in another direction. Well, that, that same section where it says all are called a few choose to listen, it also, then he clicks right into it, as he always does. He says, in the end, everyone will listen. Everyone will come home. You know, he, he rolls right off of, the first part was just a reinterpretation of the Bible, Bible right. about the chosen ones. Right. So he, you know, the Course is here to correct the misinterpretations. So he's going right after the chosen ones with that first statement. Mm -hmm. All are called, few choose to listen. He flips it over in the, in the correct way. And then he says, but in the end, everyone will come home. Everyone will choose to listen. He, he, right there, he flips it again to when? that place. Well, the when part is... is it already happened. Yeah, the, is the, we're back to that time thing. Are we going to to give over to be taken into the before Abraham was I am? Are we going to the I am-ness, or are we going to ask the questions inside of this imaginary loop, Groundhog Day loop, like like Phil does, you remember? Right. Oh, Phil's got a lot of questions, and <laughs> and Phil is quite hesitant. If you remember Groundhog Day, he's not like he's not jumping <laughs> into being truly helpful. You know, he, it's not till later that that the ladies are in the car and he's like jacking up, he's fixing the flat tires, and then the guy chokes on the the, the bone or the piece of meat, and he mm -hmm. he does the Heimlich maneuver, and you know. It takes him a while before he gets into being truly helpful, like the Rest prayer at the beginning yeah. of the Course. Yeah. But really, that, that is a good question in the sense that, am I going to go more into trusting the I am is going to beam me up prior to time, or am I going to frustrate myself in the loop with... Basically, at one point, Jesus says, are you ready to help me save the world? You know, he, that's the question. He's like, all the other questions are like dancing around, and then the, the real question is, are you ready to help me save the world? And he also was very practical, even with Helen and Bill, because they did ask that question at one point, how did this happen in the first place? But he took the time to say, well, judging by your perceptions and your emotions, your emotional roller coaster ride, what you call the human condition, you believe that it did happen. So, he's he's even saying, you believe that it did. Not that it did, but you believe that it did. And your mind is so powerful that if you believe something, you he says, what you believe you make true for you. That's very subjective. There's, you know, he's talking about for the ego. What, what the ego believes is real, the whole cosmos demonstrates as, as actually being a reality. So it's like making a false reality and then getting so addicted to the false reality that the amnesia is taken so firmly hold. It sounds like a Twilight Zone episode <laughs> where you, you're just like, uh-oh, how do I get out of this thing, you know? That's, that's what we're dealing with. But we will succeed because it's inevitable. Yeah. That's the best I can okay. tell you. So why don't we have a prayer? Sandara can come up and use this. You want a microphone for this? Oh. Why not? Um, I, I'm not used to using a mic. Okay, very so. good. Very good. <laughs> um, but I, I, first of all, I wanted to thank you guys for coming, and I wanted to thank mm. all of you for coming, mm -hmm. and everybody who helped me when I first came in, uh, when we first came in, when we first came together here today. Mm -hmm. There were a whole bunch of people, mm -hmm. Mike and... Uh, Era, and it's just all sorts of people, Donna and the people who are helping at the table. So thank you all for the support. And um, it was so interesting today when I was, you know, zipped down and started cleaning the ledge up. Um, actually, last night, there were, right there um, on the floor 
was this strange thing that I've never seen before. And it says, hello, my name is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> On your floor. On my floor. I have never seen this, this thing <laughs> ever, ever. And um, I was struck sitting there about the similarity between the title of your book and that name. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, this moment is the miracle. And my name is perfect. And so what came up, I have two pieces that I was of music that I was like given in a microsecond where, you know, one second no music and the next second the whole piece. And this is the one that I think most aligns with that and most aligns with what you're saying about this moment is the miracle. And um, it's the peace invocation from the Isa Upanishad because it's just accepting that peace and, and allowing. Um, uh, you know, if you don't allow all A-L-L, you're left with ow. Um, O W of the all wow, and so this is the from the Isa Upanishad uh, in Sanskrit, um, and it's the invocation that seeds peace. And um, I got it uh, was with ninety people uh, on the shores of uh, Bali, sending uh, March two thousand six equinox, sending. In silence, we were asked at 4.36 a.m. to send energy to the Indonesian tsunami that had happened at that point in time and all the people affected by it. And one second, no music, and that second of the equinox, I got this piece. And the Sanskrit is, Om Purnamida, Purnamidam, Purna, Purnam, Mudachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Om Shanti 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 and it means Om peace, peace, peace and I send this to uh, each of your hearts and connect it to each heart everywhere and the craziness we live in and everything each of us is going through and I just send you peace and gratitude for being here and for existing and daring to live your life as you. And uh, what it means is, Om, peace, peace, peace. This is perfect. That is perfect. From the perfect comes the perfect. Take the perfect from the perfect and only perfection remains. Om, Peace, peace, peace. Mm -hmm. Did you say that English part one more time? This, this is perfect. perfect. That is it's perfect. perfect. From, From the perfect comes, comes the, the perfect. perfect. Take the perfect. From the perfect and only perfection remains. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Shanti, Shanti. Shanti.
chanter. Shanti, Shanti. 